schedule tonight. All right, so first and foremost, before we get started, I want to thank our partners, Atlanta Tech Village, uh, David Lightburn, Vice President Karen, uh, Caitlin, and Hilton for always coordinating these amazing events. Uh, the man responsible for exploding your taste buds, Ricky Waya of Waya Hospitality. The staging and lighting by PHP Events, video production by DariusHill.com. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a true story. While I was planning this event, all my beer sponsors backed out. So normally, you know, well actually who I called was Wild Heaven. They came through with emergency beer. Please give it up for them. Um, and make sure you grab the free beer coupon. Awesome. Next, we have Hypopotamus, the number one newsletter that brings you the best uh, startup news in the tech scene in Atlanta. And give it up for our official DJ today, the letter L Beats and Producer Grind. All right, so for the past month, we had applications open. Uh, from across the country, we got several numerous applications and we had a group of third party of co-founders, founders, tech professionals, students, everyday consumers, cast their votes. And these are the four companies that made it tonight. So um, we have our panel of judges. They're going to choose the winner. And the, win the winner receives six months free membership right here in Atlanta Tech Village. All right, so introducing our judges, first up, this man needs no introduction. Entrepreneur, music genius, Jermaine Dupree. Please give it up for our honorary guest. <laughs> Next, we have Joe Beverly. He's the president of Atlanta Technology Angels. This group has been around since 1998 as one of the nation's top investment networks. Don't go till you meet Joe. Um, third, we have Karen Houghton. Vice President of Atlanta Tech Village. This is the fourth biggest tech hub in America. She is responsible for helping to cu cultivate the startup community and fostering entrepreneurship right here in Atlanta. And fourth, we have Anthony Newstead, Global Director of Emerging, Emerging Technologies and Strategic Innovation for Coca-Cola. He's also the co-founder of the Bridge Community, a startup program for early stage technology companies. If you're looking for corporate startup collaboration, he's your guy. The rules. Each, each finalist has five minutes to pitch their idea, then up to 10 minutes, the judges will have Q&A. If we have time, audience can ask questions as well. All right, you guys ready for your first finalist? All right. Standing 5'10 out of Howard University, with the MBA from Clark Atlanta. He's a former chess master that loves to produce music and debate with friends. He has no respect for you if you believe in cow tipping. He, he predicted Jon Snow is the true king of Game of Thrones. Please give it up for CJ Mitchell. Good evening, everyone. My name is CJ Mitchell, and I'm the co-founder of Instrumentally, the future of music karaoke apps. Instrumentally is a mobile app that allows you to shoot short rap videos to instrumental music. We're unique because we allow you to be the star of a really cool looking rap video to music that is actually created by you or your friends. But before I get into that, allow me to give you a brief history of myself. I'm a part-time music producer with over 10 years experience in selling beats online, 
Um, some of my uh, customers include notable hip hop acts such as Wale and Dr. Dre, but more importantly, I've sold beats to countless of other independent rappers across the globe, all looking to get their careers off the ground. And it was in working with those artists that I realized that they all faced the same problem. And that's that being expensive. You need money to buy beats, recording equipment, studio time, and to promote your music. And unless you have a major label backing you to front those costs, that is the number one problem that every independent artist across the globe has to solve. Most of these artists are teenagers, young adults, under-resourced people in different countries such as Africa and Asia and the Middle East. And unfortunately for them, most of today's solutions still lead to more issues. For example, they could decide to purchase the equipment to record their music on. Unfortunately for them, they're faced with the struggles of having to pay for that, music, that, that equipment on the front end and the time it takes to actually learn how to use the equipment. And if you're a teenager, imagine coming to your mom and saying, Mom, I need $3,000 to record raps to share with my friends. It's not going to happen. Option two, they can go to a professional studio. But then the professional studio is charged by the hour. The engineer is charged by the hour. So technically, they're getting rewarded the longer it takes for you to record your music, and it's rewarding their inefficiency. And then third, they can, you can do what most of us do whenever we're faced with a solution. You can look for a mobile app to solve this problem. Allow me to introduce you to Instrumentally, the world's first streamlined mobile application for today's rapper, where we give you the beats, we give you the recording studio, and we give you the platform to promote your music directly across the globe to all of your fans. What you're seeing here is the output of one of our, of how you could actually use our application, mixed with a little bit of AR technology. You can clearly see that this video will help you stand out amongst the millions of people doing social media rap challenges across the globe. But this is just the tip of the iceberg of how we're actually pushing this AR technology. Allow me to explain. What you're now seeing is the beta of the future state of our application, where we infuse the new and exciting technology of augmented reality, and we recreated the popular song, Take On Me by AHA. Using this technology, we can immerse our users into a variety of different environments, such as nightclubs, studios, swimming pools, and they can be the star of a really cool looking rap video that, to music that is actually created by them. For example, this video stars Chip. He's a 48-year-old father of three who recorded this in his living room <laughs> because his son did a hip hop cover of Take On Me. Chip can now take this video and share it across any of his favorite social media platforms and indirectly promote his son's rap song and instrumentally in the process. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why we are the future of music karaoke apps, which happen to be one of the fastest growing mobile app genres in the world, bolstering over 500 million users worldwide and growing, with the market leaders having valuations that exceed $1 billion. In fact, one of the market leaders musically was just acquired last year for a $1 billion after only being launched for less than two years. However, all of their business models is heavily focused on popular music and licensing that popular music, which is expensive. Our differentiation is not only the AR technology I just showed you and that we're focusing on hip hop, but more importantly that we're focusing on the original music creation space, which is saving us millions in overhead costs, which is why we've been able to become a top 300 music app in the world right now today with no funding. Our average users use our app for more than 30 minutes at a time, and when they're using it, they're using it to listen to beats, write to beats, or record their rap songs. So our goal is to continue to grow and roll out these new features and begin monetizing the app with our subscription-based model and, our, and, and selling 99 cent audio and video filters for enhancing the user's content. Now allow me to introduce you to my team. Combined, we have over 30 years experience in building enterprise mobile applications for Fortune 500 companies. Roderick and Tremaine, they handle the tech. Andre and I, we handle the business and operations, and together we are Instrumentally, a mobile app that you can download in your iOS app store right now. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> uh, my question is, you talked about being ranked, uh, I think you said 248 in the App yes. Store. Yes. How, how are you scaling your users? Like, How many new users are you getting daily or weekly? Um, we get on average around three to 400 uh, daily downloads. Most of that, 60, over 60% 60 of that comes directly from um, the search ads um, or search engine inside the AOS App Store. Uh, a remaining 20 or so percent is coming directly from our social media feeds of YouTube 
and um, Facebook, and so people are finding us organically. We were originally spending um, money for search ads through Google Ads and stuff like that, but once we took into account um, how far we need to get them down the funnel for activation, referral, and retention, it ended up being incredibly too costly for us since we're a startup and we're not being funded right now. Does and that answer your question? It does. And then you okay. mentioned being sticky, so you had about a 30-minute kind of usage at a time. Yes. How many of those users are returning? Right now, um, our retention, our, our day one retention is 55%. Our day 30 retention is around 35%. Um, we're still struggling with the product market fit after day 30. That's what we're really focusing on right now is to, is to retain the stickiness. Um, primarily, it's really just around us just getting um, and improving on the actual product bug features and fixes and things like that. Um, hi there. Um, so, thought occurred to me that this is um, potentially quite an interesting scouting tool. And do you have any um, sort of back end services for um, labels and artists to try and, and establish artists to, to explore the talent that's coming through your, your platform? All, all of those things are things that we would love to do, but like right now we're a startup, and the only yeah. thing we can do is focus on getting the users, retaining the users we have. Um, a pie in the sky dream, absolutely. I mean, if we technically, and I'm pretty sure Mr. Dupree will agree to this, technically if you control the recording process, the artist discovery process, the promotion mm -hmm. process, you're kind of already your own labels. So, um, yeah. yeah, so we're already thinking in that light, but we have to take it one step at a time, which is primarily focusing on the recording process and adding value to our current customers right now. All right. And, and is, is there a, a, a social aspect to when, when a user puts up a track yeah. um, into your platform, is there a, you know, there are tools in there for him to socialize that to other people that are using that, that, yes. that platform? Yes, yeah, so you can share out any instrumentals or any of your recordings directly across any of your favorite social media platforms. Okay. Thank you. How much are you looking to raise and under what terms? Right now, um, we're looking to raise a minimum of $500,000 um, primarily to get, get us full time. Right now, we've all of our co-founders, my, my co-founders and us, we've all been nice and weekends moonlighting on this. So we're looking to raise roughly $500,000 to get us off the ground. That'll give us at least a 12-month runway so that we can figure out this product market fit and continue to improve on the AR component of our application. And, and from the terms, we're really just looking for people that can, um, VCs that have experience in consumer products or social mobile, social mobile products, and we can have a partnership with somebody like Mr. Dupree or something that can help us push and market the application as well um, through like social media challenges, what have you. Who is your CTO? Hey, can you tell me a little more about how you're utilizing the AR? Sure, um, right now it's still in its infancy and what we're using it for is to uh, place a, an individual that's trying to do a recording in different situations that uh, we have grafted on uh, different scenes inside of the application. So we have a bunch of artifacts that we've currently created that, is a, that are able to apply that to different tracks um, on, the, on the fly. So the 48-year-old father of three that you guys kind of used, was that that was just a kitchen that you guys had created, and then he was also, because augmented is usually like, um, I guess, I guess I'm trying to understand how you're really positioning that. Is it the scene that you're selling? Is it, what? what's the selling factor? It's that? a little bit of both. Um, we are able to graph uh, different artifacts onto your current environment, and we're also able to replace it. So it's inside. mixed reality, and that's why I was trying to figure out if it's, so it's mixed yeah. and augmented. Yes. Got it. Right. Um. So you asked about, I mean, you started off saying that um, about people not being able to afford studio costs and this, that, and third. So is it instrumentals on there that they can make songs to that, that that's, is that's what's happening? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So what happens when they make the song to that instrumental? What happens to the song? Like, who's the people that's involved with the song? And how do they get involved with the person that puts a song on there and they put it on the internet and it blows up? <laughs> See, you're thinking from a music label standpoint. Oh, no, that's a whole bunch of shit that's going to happen right there. Right. I'm just, explaining <laughs> you, like, right. I'm just right. trying to tell you. Right. Um, like right now, we have, right now we have a, um, a use inside of our user agreement that makes sure that all of our producers that's uploading the content and we're scouting all the producers. We're literally getting hundreds of messages from producers every day trying to get on our platform. Um, and we are filtering those through a funnel right now. 
and we're making sure that all of our producers are uploading original content, unsampled content, and are agreeing to our terms of use, which is that this, this is the content that they actually own. Now, from a creation standpoint of what actually happens after they make a song and blow up, for me, that sounds like one of those good problems that we haven't been faced with yet. Um, I hope that happens, but we haven't even gotten that far yet. Just a quick one, is it Android and, and iOS? It's iOS only right now. Android is coming within okay. the next week. And, and the method of recording, is it directly in, into, the, into the phone or are, you, or are you people just recording on their own equipment? All through, all through your headphones. I mean, technically, um, a music studio, the only thing it is is headphones and a microphone whenever you're right. inside a booth. All of us in this room, we have recording equipment, headphones and microphones probably in our pockets and purses right now. And the software on the iPhone is probably 10 times more powerful than stuff that Jermaine Dupri was probably using in the 90s. Thank you. Uh, why are you gonna point at me? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're the only rapper here. I mean, you're the only. You know, no, you're right. Rapper. I mean, you're right. I mean, yeah. you know, when you first start out, you don't really have. You know, you just start now. They don't really. They do got a bunch of. They got apps on the phone. That's apps anyway. You know what I mean? So yeah. you don't need that. You can definitely do it. Yep. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, instrumentally. All right, ladies and gentlemen, one more time for CJ Mitchell. All right, our second finalist. Is TJ Walker here? Okay, hold on. He's a Georgia boy from Albany State University. He loves his, to coach his son's sports teams. He hits the snooze button at least three times every morning. At 12 years of age, he was chosen by Duke University to take the SATs to be one of the top seventh graders in the nation. Please help me welcome T.J. Walker. Okay, y'all, I'm going to start off by showing y'all the video. Meet Ethan and Mariah Walker. Their dad wakes them and gets them on the bus. They arrive at school and are greeted at the door by the school teacher. They have a great day at school. Now the school day is over and it's time to go home. The gym coach helps them into their carpool ride, driven by a neighborhood parent, and are taken to their after school activity. Mariah and Ethan's parents don't know that any of this has happened, but they sure would like to know and the school would love to provide that info to them. Enter tabs a mobile app that allows both parents and school administrators to track and report students' arrival and departure status. TABS is a platform that provides transparency to schools and parents about the kids' arrival and departure status and important alerts. Let's fast forward. Mariah and Ethan's school now uses TABS. When they arrive at school on the bus, they are checked in by the teacher and a push notification is sent to their parents. They leave school in their carpool and a push notification is sent to their parents. Their parents can also change their writer type status. The school and parent can also message each other within the app. Oh, it's bad weather that may close the school or cause delays? The school can send school-wide alerts to everyone in the school community to let them know. Everyone is on the same page. Visit our website at www.keeptabson.com. Leave your info and we will contact you to talk more about our amazing app. Don't worry, keep tabs on. Okay, this problem comes from something that happened to me. So right now schools are tracking the students' whereabouts, the departures, and the arrivals, but they have no way to report it. So they're tracking this using Excel spreadsheets, pen and paper, students holding up cards so that they can call their number, but there's still no way to report it. So parents are looking into a black box. So what TABS does is it allows them 
to manage this process and track and report it. Now, parents can also go onto the platform and make transit status changes, meaning that they can also go in and change like a car rider to a bus rider. Just one moment. Okay, so um, they can also engage in two-way communication, meet more like text messaging within the app so that they can com communicate to the school. So what happened to me is about a couple of weeks ago, the tornado hit outside of my uh, subdivision. I didn't know if the kids had to go to school. My house was actually damaged. So the bus just showed up. No warning, nothing. Um, I just got back from New Orleans on Monday. I couldn't get to the school on time to pick my kids up. Couldn't let the school know unless I called them. So those processes are disjointed. There's no uh, technology solution to overlay something that they're already doing. So we're not changing anything. We're just putting the technology solution on top of existing processes. The market for this is K through five. So we're talking about almost 100,000 schools. That's public, private, and charter schools. Now, we're talking about over 20 million students in that market as well. In that market, you will see competitors like Remind. And if you're a parent, you probably know what Remind is. You all probably also know what Class Dojo is. Um, maybe Here Comes the Bus and other apps of that nature that track the bus. The problem is they only track the bus. They don't track the student. So if the student doesn't get on the bus, you don't know until the bus arrives. And Class Dojo and Remind, they focus on the in-classroom experience uh, so that the parent knows what's going on with homework. But there's a big gap. There's a technology loop that needs to be closed. We need to know where these kids are after they get to school. Do they get to the classroom? Did they get off the bus? Did some, the wrong person pick them up? Things of that nature. So that's where TAP steps in. Our, our features focus on that gap, which offers us a competitive advantage, number one. That is, we're focusing on the safety while they focus on the academics, and they're focusing on the bus. The bus is not safety, in my opinion. I have to wait to see if my kid gets off of it. Now, uh, the tech augmentation is also a competitive advantage because they're already performing this process. They're already going through it. We just have the solution on top of it to report it so that parents can keep track of it. We're not changing any behaviors when we do that. And also, we don't require any hardware installation or any type of GPS or anything added to what they already do. So... Our revenue model is gonna focus on one decision maker at the school. Instead of trying to sell to parents, we're gonna to sell to the school, the decision maker, the principal. Because once they make a software decision, they make everybody use it. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I mean. They don't care if you hate it or not. But they also have a budget as well. So that's why we're focusing there. But we're also gonna to start to focus on the parent, and we're gonna to try to get them into groups like uh, or, or, uh, change.org to try to get them to petition the school to get the product in school because nothing like this exists as far as we know. And we're also gonna approach uh, trade shows and exhibitions where the decision makers are. We're gonna focus a lot of the Facebook ads on the parents so that we can get them together into groups to ask for the uh, product. We also have about seven pilots signed up so far to run it this fall and um, also get on vendors lists. Thank you. Um, sorry, forgive me. Could you just explain again how, how you're tracking the individual child? You mentioned how some of the competitors track the bus, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. not the child. Okay. Um, but you're tracking the child. Yeah. And I'm just interested to know how, how are you doing that? OK. Right now, if uh, anybody that's a parent knows that when you drop your kid off, it's going to be a teacher. It's going to be somebody that repre represents the school out front. They're not just going to let the kid get off and wander in. Same way with the bus. So we're just going to hand them an iPad or, iPhone or an iPhone or ah, Android right. device, and we're just going to ask them to record the action. Because a lot of times they're already recording the action, but they're on paper. And the parent mm -hmm. doesn't, does not know that the kid arrived at school. So right. if I had to trust my 19-year-old niece who's not reliable to drop the kid off or pick him up. I don't know. I have to make several phone calls to figure that out. 
So, okay, all right. So, so it's a teacher that's tracking it now and, and is logging it on an iPad or a, or a phone or whatever that each child is coming onto the bus or coming off the bus rather. Yes. Is, his has arrived. Okay. Yes. And the parent then gets a notification um, somehow that there's an ID to, the, to the each child, so there's a message sent to that ID. Exactly. Um, and can that parent send a message back through the phone um, to say, for example, just to let you know today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick my child up. They just keep them back. Exactly. Example. That's where the two-way messaging comes in. So they send the, the school a message, just like yeah. a text message, to say, hold Ethan or Mariah. Right. So when I was coming back from New Orleans, for example, I wasn't going to make it to the school on time. I can call my brother. I can do all of that stuff, but I still have to call the school. But the school has a cutoff line to where you cannot take them out of the rotation. It has to be by like 1.30 or something like that. Uh -huh. This alleviates that process. They send right. a message, and they, or they just simply change their status from bus to car, and then they know, hey, take them out of the bus line, put them in the car line. And if they don't get picked up by car, by default, they go like to an after-school program. Okay, thank you. Hey. Hey. So you talked about... It as a personal pain point, but you're selling to the school or the principal or decision maker at that school. Can you share more with me about your customer and discovery process for the customer? Okay. Um, I actually interviewed several school principals. The first one I started with was my kid's school. I went to pick them up one day. It's a teacher out there with a laptop on his arm. It's like, just like now, it's like 80 degrees outside. And I asked him what he was doing. He's checking the kids out on this Excel spreadsheet. I was like, this is a pain. And I had to call up there before any of that happened and say, hey, look, don't put them on the bus. Because if they got on the bus, they were going to get home. I'm not there. And my kids are small. So um, when I did the interview, I asked them. I literally asked them, what's your pain with checking these kids in and out? Everybody I asked that to had similar answers. Um, they varied because uh, some schools, you can kind of do what you want. I talked to the executive director of Fulton County Schools. They literally allow the schools to make the choice on how they do everything. There's no formal process. And this is one of the largest school systems in the state of Georgia, as we know. So so you talked to how many people? Um, about six or seven principals and the executive director of Fulton County Schools. And my mom is actually a retired teacher. She runs the after-school program at my old elementary school. So I interviewed people. Um, and I got people that I didn't know. I got people that I, that I know. And I... Simply ask them what was their process, like where do you see the pain points? And one glaring uh, major thing came to mind. Uh, one principal said he's in APS. He said that he literally has to go to some of the kids' homes to see, like, why they're not at school because the parent went to work at 5 a.m. So that's, that's a pretty big deal. How much are you raising and under what terms? Um, I'm thinking in the range of at least around 250000 and up, and um, not sure of the terms yet. What we're trying to do is we're focusing on traction. Uh, literally on Monday, I'm starting a, uh, a blitzkrieg to try to get schools signed up. And the reason we need the, the seed funding is that if people pile onto it like we want them to, then we're going to need to scale the platform. So we're going to need to just hire, uh, I guess, technical people to help us scale it as well as hire people to help market the platform. But we kind of have, ha have an issue where we may not be able to afford um, to run the platform if we get too many people signed up. And the product does exist, or it's in beta, yes. or? Well, it's about to be in beta. We're running the pilots okay. this uh, fall. But if we can get it finished by early May, we're going to try to get it into some summer camps. And I've spoken to another company that said switch ours with us about using it for his uh, summer camps where he tracks kids going to and from sports camps. So we may start there if we finish soon enough. And did you develop the software? Or do you have someone on your team who developed it? Or what, who's, how's it developed? Well, I hired someone, but they may join the team. Um, but I did the UX design myself. So I, I, I uh, prototyped it. I did all the research, prototyped it, came up with the concept and everything else that you that you see here. And so I just want to know, what did you make on the SAT? <laughs> it was horrible. You don't, you don't have to say. You don't have to say. You, you know, were only I can't 12. remember. It was like uh, I, I got high on the, the ITBS test, 
So it was like seven of us. We took it. And honestly, I was just sitting around the high school with kids. I didn't know what to do. I was marking answers. So. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, teach it. Okay. Waverly Hall, Georgia. <laughs> Harris County. Callaway Gardens. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, man. Hey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, TJ Walker. All right, our third finalist. You can call him the next Bear Grylls because he loves the outdoors and mountain biking. He's not great at playing guitar, but loves Jimi Hendrix. He once started a line of butcher shops in Atlanta. Hates when people are late to meetings. The original bulldog straight from UGA. Please welcome Rob Dillon. My bad, I didn't know there were two screens to this thing. Is that what you said? Okay. I'm not sure why it's doing that, so hold up one sec. Yeah. Wait. All right, tech genius up here. How's everybody doing? Uh, excited to be here, man, great crowd. Um, great job so far by these guys, uh, well done. Uh, so my name is Rob Dillon. I am the uh, founder CEO of Smash Mouse. I am trying to revolutionize hands-free control of digital devices. Uh, so I guess I'll give you kind of the funny story version. So about five, six years ago, came down for Christmas one day, my wife, uh, or I guess Christmas day, uh, wife had put a cheap acoustic guitar underneath the tree. It was her not-so-subtle way of telling me that uh, she was calling me out, that when I kept telling her I was going to my friend's house, just staying out late, drinking beer, uh, playing guitar, trying to learn how to play. Uh, she's like, you got two kids at home. If you want to learn how to play, play at home. So I said, all right. So I did what everyone else does nowadays, learning how to play. I went on the uh, internet, downloaded uh, sheet music to my favorite songs, got out iTunes, started using YouTube to figure out uh, videos that I could watch, and quickly realized a problem that all musicians have. More than ever, technology is being used by musicians to learn, to play, to record, and even perform music. But they all got the same problem. Every instrument takes two hands to play, except for the maracas and that little thing that Neil Young wears around his neck with a harmonica. I don't count that one. But you got two hands doing this, so how do you control the technology, right? You don't. You're doing this. Drove me crazy. So I'm like, I'll figure out a solution. I'll get myself a foot mouse. So I went online, and I'll never forget, literally one of the first images is some guy had taken a flip-flop, and he had cut it out, and he would put mouse hardware in it, and he called that a foot mouse. And that was literally one of the first things that popped up. The number one device on the market you can see in this picture is basically a slipper you put on your foot, and you move your foot around like this to move the pointer, and then you got to kick the Fisher-Price button over here, and you do the foot mouse shuffle trying to control the computer. I'm like, that ain't very good. And there were other switches and devices that could do things, but they didn't do what I wanted to do, and I had to, had to buy a bunch of different products. So I did what any innovator does. I invented a better mouse, Smash Mouse. So Smash Mouse is a pedal that allows universal control of digital devices. It starts very simply. Move your foot around, up, down, left, right. Smash it in the middle for left click. You got right click functionality down here. Click the left button, it's a mode button. Now it's in playback mode. Any pro audio software, multimedia player, browser, you name it. Stop, rewind, fast forward, record, all with one kick command. So I thought I had something pretty cool. So I went out to the NAM show, National Association of Music Merchandisers, back in January 2017. This was my market validation trip, trying to figure out who I could talk to to see what they thought, right? So I went out there overwhelmingly positive support. Hundreds of people wanted the product. USA Today named us one of the seven coolest things at the show. This is the world's largest music merchandiser show, and here I am in my little booth. I didn't even have my prototype with me because it wasn't ready yet. 
went back this year, got named Best Controller by Sonic State, which is a big European website that does electronic dance music, digital MIDI type control devices. So we're definitely on the right path. More importantly, leading distributors across the globe, North America, South America, Japan, Europe, have all given me letters of intent that said, if you can build that, put it in the price range you're talking about, we want to buy it from you. So I said, this is pretty cool. But here's where it gets even more interesting. Other people started coming to me with the same problem, right? We're all using the same technology from the 50s. We got two hands on a keyboard, one on a mouse. We're not efficient. So if you're doing any task that requires you to use one or two hands and control your device, you're not getting it done right. So we started having people come to us, people like special needs assistive technologies, pretty obvious, right? We can custom control up to 10 commands. You just kick in that direction, any keyboard shortcut is done with one kick. But there were others, gaming industry, a uh, huge opportunity where they're coming to us. Imagine having one for the PC gaming, not only to control one quick uh, functionality so you can twitch faster, but imagine even putting one under each foot and having fully immersive gaming, virtual reality, augmented reality, totally changing the landscape on how you can play and immerse yourself in a game. Manufacturing, medical, you name it, they're all coming knocking on the door. But I will tell you, just so you know, all you investors out there, I am micro-focused on music right now. We're only doing that. But we want to build an ecosystem, basically, and this is where what I think it's kind of fun. Basically, I am a hardware company to many people, right? I'm the outlier in these types of buildings. Uh, in fact, I told people I was a pre-revenue hardware company. I got laughed out of investment meetings. I said, that's all right. So we're building a software company on a hardware platform. Think of the smartphone, right? You buy our standard unit, comes out of the box. In fact, this Tuesday, April 17th, we're launching our Kickstarter campaign. For $80, you can get one of these. It'll work out of the box with Windows, Mac OS, full mouse functionality, full playback functionality, uh, and then we'll have it download other apps that you can get for added functionality like MIDI, playback, per, uh, turn, page turner, and more. So basically, going out to the market, looking to raise a little capital and make it happen. Great pitch, by the way. Um, so is the idea also to, to allow people to go and build um, app solutions on this and create a marketplace for it so that when you buy the hardware, you can go to this marketplace and download multiple solutions? So that could be used for all sorts of different devices. Yeah, I call it a universal pedal. It's a shout out to people my age who used to have the universal remote control and you controlled multiple devices with it. Uh, I was going to get to this, but I was getting the times up. So thank yeah. you for asking this question. Yeah, uh, yeah what I want to build is a community of users uh, right. where you can actually have anyone develop an application for music and any uh, interface and sell it in what I call Smash Mart. Smash Mart's my app store. Give me 3% royalty. I sell the hardware. Let's all work together to build the new way to control digital yeah. devices. There you go. Thanks. Just so I can be consistent, what are you looking to raise? I uh, knew it was coming. Thanks for asking, Joe. Congrats on the new role, by the way. Um, so I am looking to raise, uh, so I've raised about 125000 what I call pre-seed capital. Uh, that was to give me a runway to get through Kickstarter, which a lot of people, if anyone wants to do Kickstarter, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. It is a formula. It costs money. It is not throwing an ad up on Craigslist. Don't be fooled. Uh, so I've raised money for that, as well as to get some uh, subsidiz subsidization capital for the manufacturing process. But to answer your question, uh, once we get through Kickstarter and do what I call valuate the company, I think we validated it. Now we're going to evaluate it. I'm going to be looking to raise about $2 million with north of a $10 million valuation so I can uh, give up less than 20% control. Probably still look to do an angel model with a convertible note and be aggressive in getting those early adopters an opportunity to get involved. But specifically look for investors who can bring something to the table, help me out with the areas that I can't help, whether it be music, technology, scaling, et cetera. Is it a little bit of a small market going after just music? Because it seems like it has wide applicability. Well, we're starting with music because, again, I want to be micro-focused uh, as a CEO. Again, I was really impressed by him talking about focusing on scaling up in steps. Uh, so music's actually a $16 billion industry. Over $8 billion of that is just on the accessory market. So basically anyone who's using an instrument to learn or to record is a potential customer. So we have a significant lifestyle business there. 
Uh, the gaming will be the next big step, $100 billion industry with the largest sector being the uh, PC gaming space where they're looking for customizable efficiency tools. And then once you get beyond that, it's just uh, you know, medical manufacturing. There's just a, a plethora of opportunities. Do you already know where and how you're going to manufacture these at scale? As a matter of fact, I do. I have been, uh, on the last four or five months, I've been on my journey as a CEO, fully recognize my strengths and weaknesses. One of them is I am not an electrical engineer. Uh, I did not code the firmware for this, which, by the way, it works on a, a HID firmware, so that's why I can plug into any uh, Windows or uh, Mac OS system. We'll have Bluetooth low energy for mobile soon. So I went on a journey because I didn't want to do the Chinese tooling model, where I was told I'd have to pay $50,000 up front and then do a minimum order quantity of about 5,000 units. So you're looking at 250 grand to manufacture a first run. So you can imagine that was a little daunting. Uh, so basically, I've identified a company called M-Wave International, located here in Chicago, or here in the US, I should say, in Chicago. They actually are a low production manufacturer. They focus on that. And they recently purchased Morley Pedals, which is one of the largest guitar pedal companies in the world. And so it's a perfect synergy. They're not only going to help us develop the product and manufacture, but we're going to leverage them for uh, distribution as well. Yeah, back in the back. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have filed a patent. Uh, I think it was uh, number 15, whatever, whatever it says up here. Uh, yeah, so we have a pretty broad-ranging patent. We've already gotten our first office action back uh, about a week ago. Uh, we've had our conversation with the patent office. We've addressed their concerns. We're feeling really confident. Hopefully uh, three to six months, because uh, we did the express version. Uh, we'll be able to say we're fully patented as the only multifunctional foot pedal in the world, which obviously gives us a lot of opportunity and protection. Okay. Uh, software right now is all firmware, like I said. So basically, it's kind of weird. It's kind of great the way the device works is it just sends the same type of commands as a keyboard sends. So there's really nothing proprietary there. The proprietary on the software will come later when we develop our own products within other industries. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Rob Dillon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our fourth and final finalist. This is an entrepreneur duo. She likes to sing, but not your ordinary singer because she was trained in opera. He likes to box and travel the world. She's a self-taught coder who hates inefficiencies and limited thinking. He's related to Bob Marley through his cousin. She's a yellow jacket buzzing out of Georgia Tech. He's a Seminole out of Florida State University. They both hate Atlanta traffic. Please welcome Jerrica Richardson and Daniel Santos. Good luck, y'all. Okay, good evening. My name is Daniel Santos. I am one half of Hackout Ninja. I handle the financials operations, so I'll, whenever you have questions, feel free to field them my way. And I'm Jerrica Richardson, the other half. Um, so what we're here to present, thank you all for being here, is Hackout Ninja. And Hackout.Ninja is actually the name of the product itself. So the idea here is that innovators should not be limited. So this is where you can go to stimulate innovation, to trade and sell innovation, et cetera. So let's get to the problem itself. What we've noticed being in this space is that innovating can be very, very expensive. That's one of the reasons why we're all here, because some of us are pitching for money, we're pitching for help, we're pitching for testers, so on and so forth. And when it comes down to organizations, groups, and companies, that's their reality as well. 
development, prototyping, et cetera. And so that's one of the problems that's being faced. Another issue is that sometimes the regions that are looking to engage in innovation have limited resources and infrastructure, right? Think of northern Nigeria, where there are issues with accessing the internet or accessing you know, cable lines, okay? Um, another thing is that when, when it's time to actually test or implement your ideas, it's very difficult to know where to go next. Where are the resources that help you go to the next stage? Okay, so Hackout Ninja was kind of born to, to deal with all of these different issues, but the way that we're doing it, there are three specific steps. These are, this is really our product roadmap. So right now, what, we're trying to, what we've developed is the ultimate hackathon planning platform. So if you're trying to stimulate innovation, which how many of you guys have heard of hackathons? All right, that's a, good, that's a good showing. Hackathon is really just an event where people come together to solve problems and they innovate and then they win prizes, they compete for prizes. Companies love to do them because of mar for marketing reasons, for technology improvement reasons, et cetera. But the issue is, is a lot of the organizations that can leverage hackathons have difficulty knowing how to put them on because they can be kind of expensive. You're dealing with a lot of people, you're dealing with a lot of intellectual property, and you have to figure out how to implement the solutions that get developed at these particular events. The second component to our product roadmap are innovation incentives. So you have a, and we have an entire ecosystem of innovators. How do we incentivize the activities that they do? How do we reward them for being innovative? And the third category is the actual ideation product market itself. How do you take the, all that innovation that comes from hackathons, that comes from organizations and companies to a place where people can trade and sell resources and ideas? Okay, so this right now, we're in our phase one for our product. This product was just released last August. Super exciting, because I built it. I'm a full stack developer, and that's, it's, it's just exciting to see it actually come to fruition. So what does the hackathon market look like? Here's something special. It's a new market to a certain degree. So there's not a lot of data that's out there on, um, on the hackathon market itself, but we've been able to procure quite a bit of analysis. So one of the key things that you want to focus on is the fact that it has an 80% market growth rate year over year. It is, in terms of countable public hackathons, there are about 3,500 worldwide that occur annually. But like I said, that number increases at about 80%. And about 82% of those large hackathons are concentrated within the uh, Fortune 500s. So that's exciting. Um, the market continues to grow because hackathons are a lot cheaper than hiring people full time. Hackathons are effective because you're crowdsourcing ideation, innovation, and able to leverage that and the networks associated with that innovation. So we're not seeing hackathons die anytime soon. Okay, a lot more data there. But this is what we have right now. So the 2018 March numbers, we released the product and we have not started marketing yet. So everything has been word of mouth, has been beta testing, and we've had several hackathons on the platform thus far. Um, we have about 453 users and we are net positive in revenue. Where we're looking to go is the release of these, of these future products as mentioned in the product roadmap. So we're looking to grow into um, a component, the innovation incentives, that's called Gidget, okay? Gidget is where when you jump on the platform at this point, you're able to collect innovation points for going to hackathons, for coming up with ideas, creating teams, and then you're able to use those points to acquire things that are not yet on the market. Okay, thank you. That's it. Question. Um, hi there. So um, one question I got is you mentioned along the way is one of the pain points was that corporations don't know how to utilize the solutions that come out of the hackathon. And so we, I'm, I'm Coca-Cola by the way, so we run a number of hackathons ourselves as well and one of the key things that we try and ensure is that the hackathon comes from an actual tangible business problem that we're trying to, that we're facing and we have the business support um, behind it so that when a solution is picked we've got traction within the organization. But I'm just intrigued because you raised, you flagged that as a key point. 
I'm intrigued w within your your um, plan here. What's the process of encouraging that? So there are a couple pieces to that answer. Thank you for your question, by the way. Um, when a hackathon occurs, if you're attending as a team, you're able. You have your own dashboard. You have your own space to do your innovation, your own calendar, and so you're able to actually do your own project management, which corresponds with the organizer of the event itself. And then the innovation incentives are used so that as you work on your product, you get innovation points that you can then use in the market for products that are not available on the market yet, like on the real market. And um, the other side to it is that we create tools so that, for instance, if you have a team, it's a one-click button where it turns into its own website. So you can quickly do customer discovery for your ideas. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I'm a little confused on exactly what the platform looks like. So are you, are, is it an organizer tool? Is it actually a platform where your developers are on there, so then they're all in there for like 24 hours, 48 hours, and then they're out? And then, like, we host a lot of hackathons, obviously, here as well. Some of them are with Amazon, and, you know, we've done them with the Atlanta Braves, but also a lot of them are the nonprofits who don't have money to pay for this kind of platform. So I'm, that's kind of two questions. Number one, what, is, like, what does it actually look like when I'm in there, and who's, who's the user? And then also, how, does that, how are you really selling to them? So think of Eventbrite. When you jump on, you have your own profile and you can create an event. When you create a hackathon or an ideation session, however, you, whatever terminology you like to use, you're then redirected to your own dashboard. And that's where you manage and plan all of the innovative, all of your, all aspects of your event. So registration, a landing page, the data, the reporting, the team management, attendees. You get your own landing page that's auto-generated. You also have um, a suggested budget. So say you know you want 100 people, you drag the slider, and it'll tell you how much you should anticipate spending. When it comes down to the actual planning steps, it will auto-generate a calendar so that every day you know exactly what you should be doing so that you can have a successful hackathon. So it's a much more robust Eventbrite specifically for hackathons. Correct. And just to add to that point, it's a multi-touch system. So while the admin does have everything we spoke on, the actual end users also have a place to continue their journey, project management, development, crowdsource, things like that. How do you charge for it? Uh, multiple ways. So for the organizers, it's a flat fee or it's an annual subscription, depending on how many hacks you're throwing. Like Coca-Cola, the enterprise group, they throw annual hacks, they throw monthly hacks, things like this. So for large organizations, we actually do a subscription model. For smaller ones, one-offs, it's 100 a pop. Um, and then the Gidget, from what she was speaking on, where you can earn points and you can actually buy development tools, we take 5% rake off of that. And there is a premium subscription model for 99 cents a month. And not to disappoint, how much are you raising? Right now, we're raising uh, 250 um, for our funding needs. It's all, we're going all the way up to about 400 And then the equity is kind of de debating on what the actual investor brings to the table, network, things like that. Any other questions? Bug bounty? I have not. Have you? Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Anyone? One right here. Absolutely. So Eventbrite, as mentioned earlier, is an example of a competitor. Obviously they host they put up every event and they do have some organizing tools. Um, we integrate with Eventbrite so that organizers who use it don't have to leave it. 
And then there is um, another application called DevPost. DevPost is uh, one of the more established groups in the industry, and they do a, a very similar thing to what we do, but there are no planning tools, nor is the data as robust. And for Hackathon IO, that's another one. Um, it's the same for that, except they only do listings for hackathons, and the data, you do receive data, but we've done comparisons on the back end, so we actually just closed with Microsoft a couple weeks ago, um, and our data, the comparison is, it trumps it, so they, they're going with us. Not that familiar with an incentive. Add to your piece, um, Innocentive is not 100% like, but similar to Angel Hacks, um, if I don't have this wrong. And so uh, how we take that um, strategy is we actually try to be a friend rather than an enemy. So like we have a global hack going on later this year, and instead of fighting Angel Hacks for it, we work in partnership. So where we have strengths, where they have strengths, we combine for the goal. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Hack out Ninja. All right, judges, um, please take 10 minutes. Uh, you can use a room in the back or here, either way. Yeah. Um, would, some, would you pick someone to come out and uh, out?